Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on compounding active versus passive and the power of the American tailwind. I'm Audrey Melville, the marketing director here at Gabelli Funds, and I will be your moderator for today's session. And I'm thrilled to be here today with my colleague, Max Sykes, who will help us discuss both these fundamental investing concepts and some of the latest investment trends and strategies. For those of you that aren't familiar, Gabelli Funds it is an asset management firm founded by Mario Gabelli in 1976. Today, we manage over $30 billion in client assets across a broad set of asset classes and investment vehicles. Our dedicated teams of analysts and portfolio managers conduct fundamental bottoms-up research utilizing our firm's private market value with a catalyst investment approach. Max Sykes is a portfolio manager for the Gabelli Equity Trust and is the sole portfolio manager for the Gabelli Financial Services Opportunities ETF, which we will discuss later today. Uh, Mac brings over 28 years of industry experience and was ranked the number one investment services analyst by the Wall Street Journal in 2010. Mac, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, so today we're going to discuss the concept of compounding, the merits of active versus passive investing, and the ETF investment landscape. We will have time for Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to pop them in to the chat and we will make sure that we get your questions answered. So to kick us off, Mac, I would love to talk about a concept that is tossed around a lot, uh, but is really critical to what we do at Cabelli and investing at large. Uh, so can you explain the concept of compounding and why it is often referred to as the eighth wonder of the world? Right. So it's often referred to by a lot of well-known investors, uh, but it was actually first coined by Albert Einstein in terms of compound interest. And he understood the idea of rolling compound returns. And if you think about a basic math example today, take the uh, choice between 1 million in your pocket today, or if I gave you a penny and I double that every day for the next 30 days, which would you rather have? Uh, and I obviously the question is, is a trick one, but in the end, after 30 days, you'd have $5.4 million. And that is just starting from a penny and doing basic compounding. So simple math there in terms of what happens, but a much differentiated income uh, outcome in terms of the power of that. And that, I think, what is what Albert Einstein understood about compound interest. And I think that's what investors have talked about today. So it's the idea of staying invested in the market, being aligned with companies that can generate significant earnings, and then also uh, employ them as well in terms of high returns on equity going forward. And so you have this virtuous cycle. And that is kind of the leg behind all the power of savings uh, for investors and why we are big advocates of this philosophy. Well, when you put it like that, I would certainly rather have the 5.4 million. Uh, so how can investors effectively utilize compounding in their investment strategy? All right. So we understand the basic term. We understand staying invested in the marketplace um, and Today, um, things are much different than when I first started. So back in, back in that day, my investor education was listening to Mario Gabelli uh, on the TV, Wall Street Week, or reading about him in Barron's, uh, and then going to uh, a long-distance phone call to my broker, calling him up and placing trades. And so that was the kind of the process for investing. But today, we have mobile apps. Uh, we have instant access to the marketplace. We have the ability to uh, buy in very, very small increments. And we have a lot of investor in education. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity set to employ the idea of compounding is much different than when I was around. And so I think that's a very powerful tool for investors today. And, and to employ the most important and, and wealth building component, which is the time value uh, that they have. So younger investors, especially um, if you have the time uh, to invest over time systematically, then you do very well. Yeah, I think that really solidifies why investing over the long term is so important to investing and, and starting early and getting invested as early as possible. So next, let's discuss the concept of active versus passive investing. What are some of the key differences between these approaches? So years ago, it was pretty much an all active investing market. Um, and then we had some passive investing tools and they proliferated. And essentially with the passive approach, you're basically just buying the entire basket of securities that are employed by that indice. And there are several indices that we know, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, other specialty uh, indices as well. So it's, it's a beta product is another name to refer to it. And essentially, you're just taking a passive approach, buying the whole basket of securities. Um, at Gabelli, we follow an active approach, and we're looking for more bespoke, personalized portfolios, 
uh, that will enhance uh, market returns. So we're looking to beat the market through uh, a more differentiated portfolio. Uh, and so there is a place for passive investing, um, which is more of a naive approach and settling for that market return, or for a firm like ours, where we have a proprietary methodology for research, uh, where we're looking to enhance those returns over the market. Great. And and how can investors think about making that choice between when to employ active versus passive products or, or strategies in their investment portfolios? So there's a couple other aspects to investing to determine returns. Uh, whether you go passive or active, it's the discipline of staying investing. So market timing in terms of moving in and out, reacting to news headlines, et cetera, that can be detrimental to returns. And we know over time that individual investors, institutions uh, do not do very well when they are emotionally engaged and don't systematically invest. So that, that's first and foremost. Number two, managing tax uh, liability, turnover within a portfolio churn in terms of extra costs for the portfolio are very important. So to the extent there's an active fund that has very high turnover, that will depress returns as well. So in selecting the different strategies, uh, again, there's a, there's a passive, the settlement of, of that return on the market, active, which we do. Uh, and from our perspective, active, um, we want to own the best breed businesses. We want to leverage what themes, what may be in the environment or the economy that are going faster than the overall uh, S&P, et cetera. And so it's, it's a chance to employ kind of a best of breed portfolio for investors, customization, et cetera, um, and you know, be differentiated. And I think for investors that are just looking for, for, for the passive approach, that's one way. Obviously, there's... We do a differentiated, we want to own, you know, more important basket. Um, that's another way. Um, there, there, it's good for both in, in some respects. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to be competitive. We think we have a, an edge with our research methodology and we want to buy uh, great businesses. Yeah. And for, for our audience, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, you, know, you mentioned the best of breed businesses. Can you talk a little bit more about our investment approach here at Cabelli and the research process and how we identify those best of breed businesses? Right. So we take a bottoms up fundamental research approach, value approach, and our investment methodology is private market value with a catalyst. So we're looking at companies that trade at a discount to intrinsic value and then an identifiable catalyst to narrow that value. Uh, and that could be a takeover. It could be an industry change, a management change, a product initiation, many different ways to get the marketplace to fully appreciate the value of those securities. And from our perspective, that is a very sensible approach. We take a very disciplined, uh, methodical approach to following the securities, getting to know the companies, meeting management teams, getting out there, intensely debating certain aspects of the businesses. And we believe that you know through the psychological impact on the discounts that occur, um, that we can find value relative to the overall benchmark and improve upon that. Great. Well, I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of those, the specific best of breed businesses that you hold in the GABF portfolio. Uh, but first, let's quickly talk about ETFs and uh, the ri their rise in popularity among investors. Uh, can you discuss what makes ETFs an attractive investment opportunity for both new and seasoned investors? Right. I think so. As a firm like Cavalli, who's been innovative and around for many years, uh, the, the goal of the firm is to offer as much choice to investors as possible. So as a firm, we, we manage mutual funds, closed-end funds, uh, separate accounts, and also alternatives. We've seen a rise in the demand for passive investing ETFs. We understand the benefits to those. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we've launched a suite of five actively managed ETFs. There are certain advantages to those taxes, tax efficiency, uh, lower uh, operational costs, et cetera. Uh, but it really is about choice for investors. And the me methodology that we employ is no different than our main funds and what we've been doing for over 30 years. And this was just a chance to do that vehicle. And, you know, we have some thematic approaches. Mine's ETF specifically is more narrow in terms of focus, uh, but, you know, a diversified and a well-balanced portfolio. So th that was just kind of an attractive component to the uh, marketplace that we saw an opportunity. And, and we've been out front with that one of the, one of the first managers to actually launch active ETFs in the space. Um, and we've seen good demand for the vehicles and good growth. Uh, we're pretty excited about the outlook. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned the uh, tax efficiencies of an ETF. 
which I know is something that uh, all investors are sensitive to. So can you elaborate a little bit more on how ETFs uh, can achieve those tax efficiencies? Right. So when you compare any, a mutual fund to an ETF, from an investor perspective, the management of the fund is very similar. There's really no difference there in terms of the approach, owning a basket of securities, it's being professionally managed, et cetera. Where ETFs are a little bit different than mutual funds is this back office component. And through a process called the create and redeem process, the ETFs manage through an intermediary, a third party, the optimization of tax lots within the portfolio. And I don't want to get into too much specifics. There's plenty of investor education about this, but essentially it enables the ETF to be rotating and optimizing that balance and to move out high tax cost lots and retain low tax cost lots in the effect of basically minimizing tax leakage. So uh, ETFs, as we know, are fairly good at minimizing tax leakage. You know, it happens occasionally, but for the most part, very efficient on that front. And so that is a unique aspect to ETFs in terms of the design today and, and desirable for investors as well. Great. No, I, th I think that's a great explanation. Now let's discuss a concept that you talk about often, the American tailwind. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this industry dynamic and how the GABF ETF is poised to benefit? All right. So the, the American tailwind of prosperity has been around for a long time, but I think it was first coined by Warren Buffett uh, several years ago. And the idea behind it is that the American system that we live in today, the economic system, the, the, uh, the rule of law, capitalism, the efficient allocation of resources, competitive nature of corporate. So this has all been around in a system and we've seen the benefits of that through prosperity. And when you look back 100, 100 plus years, you know our standard of living has just gone up tremendously and, and it gives you confidence going forward uh, in the system, in the outlook, uh, for investors. So that is a backdrop for investing in America. Uh, and one way to even look at this and, and quantify it is through household wealth. And if you just go back to 1971, at that time, household wealth was about 5 trillion. For Q23, that number is 156 trillion. So that has been multiples uh, of change over that time. And you can just see the power. And then if you look at the absolute value of 156 trillion, I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, and that is you know, through productivity, again, efficient capital allocation and this competitive nature of the corporate environment that we exist today. So this is all great for investors, uh, all great for the fundamental component to investing in America. And it provides the backdrop um, for our thesis in terms of running the fund at GABF. And we invest in financial services companies and they are particularly levered to the benefits of this American prosperity. So you think of asset and wealth management, insurance, payments companies, diversified financials. So there's a host of companies that are in this space that are really well equipped to benefit from these longer term uh, dynamics with our economy. Great. No, I think it's a really, really interesting thesis. Um, could you highlight some of the uh, some additional unique features of the GABF ETF and how it might fit into an investor's portfolio. All right, so we we started the ETF a few years ago. We've been pleased with performance. I, I I think when you look at active versus passive and competition, there we've tried to assemble a unique set of companies. So we're about forty holdings at this point uh, with good value there. And what I want to mean by that, if you look at the basket of S and P companies and uh, compare that to the the one we've put together. And to start the year, just to give you some numbers, um, our forward price earnings ratio is around 15. It's 21 times for the S&P 500, around 16 for the S&P financial services. So slightly under the benchmark, but also slightly under the overall benchmark. They're much lower than the uh, S&P 500. But our expected earnings growth rate for that set of companies is close to 14% versus the S&P is much lower than that and also the financial services industry. So when you put that together, you have a bespoke set of companies, lower price earnings multiple, which we all understand, better growth rate in terms of fundamental growth over there. So we think we've assembled a great group of companies and you can look through the list. It's JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, um, some WR Berkeley, American Express. These are a lot of household names that are run really well with great long-term track records. And so we're very excited about what we've put together here. And I think it's a, a great opportunity for investors to be a part of their portfolio. 
Yeah, no, it's been been fun to to watch you uh, build such a unique unique product. Um, when you know talking about financial services, obviously, uh, you know, a, a key theme um, that's top of mind in, in the news today is is regional banks. And so, where where do regional banks and and that dynamic fit in with the JBF portfolio? So we get this question a lot, and we obviously focus on all areas of financials. The firm is or the fund is not a bank fund, but we obviously hold banks. And so this is a pretty pretty dynamic space. As we know, we had a couple of major failures last year. Coming into the year, it's it was our approach to be more aligned and hold the larger cap companies. So you think of JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, et cetera. And these are differentiated in a couple of reasons. Uh, first, they have a diversified fee revenue source. So they're not completely re reliant on just interest income. You have input from asset wealth management, capital markets, especially uh, investment banking, advisory, custody, et cetera. So much more diversified uh, set of revenue streams, which we think is desirable in kind of a more choppy market and kind of a market where it not necessarily determined in terms of where rates may go, right? So that's still kind of open-ended. So those companies were well-positioned. They're also really well-capitalized. If you look at their capital ratios, very high relative to uh, some of the other banks, and you know, uh, 170 billion at Bank of America, for instance. I mean, just extraordinary in terms of that uh, amount of capital. And then there were two major catalysts too that we see for 23 or 24. Um, so first of all, um, net interest margins have been compressed, uh, and net interest margins are essentially what the yield is that they earn on their balance sheets. All banks have this, and essentially, uh, it's a bet. You know, you you have deposits, you have loans. And there's some offsetting component to that. And over the last year, we've had deposit costs rising quicker than they could replace loans. And so we've had pressure on net interest margins. And so net interest income, which falls to the bottom line, has been depressed as well. And so we've seen this decline over the last several quarters. And we see that potentially inflecting both 2Q, 3Q, 4Q of this year for some of these institutions, depending on how the rates go. So we see kind of inflection in the earnings momentum and growth going into 25. And so we see that as a catalyst in terms of bottling and, and better comparisons. So that's one catalyst. The second catalyst is Basel III, which if you're familiar with the industry is the capital requirements that will be changing uh, in the next year or two. And so there were proposals that came out this spring and they were pretty onerous on the major banks. Now what's Good about the higher capital retention is it makes the bank safer, but in some cases, the rules may be overshot a bit. I think we've heard some lobbying complaints from a host of constituencies. Um, so we expect some changes. And we think that's asymmetric in terms of outcome for the banks. So they're already well reserved for what might happen in a few years. So JP Morgan, et cetera. So really good shape ahead of these rules to the extent that the rules change and become a little less onerous that would be upside and could include uh, potential payouts in terms of investor feedback returns. Uh, you know, you take a bank like uh, JP Morgan, they talk about 30 billion, uh, or excuse me, the Bank of America, it's about 30 billion of excess capital and that could be paid out. So we think there's really good opportunity. We'll get some more clarity on that past the elections at the end of this year, a lot of things in motion. Uh, but again, we really like those banks. We like the earnings momentum. We think investors will discount that. Uh, and then we think they're in pretty good shape relative to the regionals. And then the last thing I would just say is that if you look at the core earnings power of banks, it's based on the funding source, right? The cost of funds. And the big banks, you know, typically at this point have the cost of deposits that are less than 2%. So the regionals, because they're more competitive in terms of, uh, raising capital, uh, raising deposits, you know, they're paying out much higher rates. Uh, and so they're three, 4% for their cost of deposits, which is a, uh, you know, competitive disadvantage in terms of generating capital, et cetera. So we, we like that going forward. Um, and the exposure to CRE, which we all know that there could be potential for real estate issues. Uh, we're a little concerned about that as well. We think that the big banks are better reserved for that, um, better operationally due diligence in terms of understanding those credits. And so it will be less impacted. So that's a concern for us in the regionals. There is a, a return or there a evaluation discrepancy, obviously, between some of the banks and that we're cognizant of that. But the operating environment, we still like the big banks at this point, even with a little higher valuation. Great. Right, interesting. Uh, no, those, those are some really interesting industry dynamics. Um, so at this point, we can go ahead and open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Mac, 
please feel free to pop those into the chat or the Q&A. Um, so we have a couple already. Uh, so our first question, someone wants to know, I use multiple approaches and ways to try to determine the intrinsic value and valuation like DCF, PG, evaluation of key ratios like ROIC, ROE, and its growth, et cetera. What are your preferred methods of determining intrinsic value and your margin of safety? Wow, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, and in fact, you know, some of those dynamics that you mentioned do change over time. Uh, you know, I think some of the the very simple, sensible metrics we use, say for the big banks, you know, price to tangible book value. And then you know, to the extent that there's some off balance sheet items like HDM securities, which don't flow into that uh, tangible book, uh, you know, we, we're cognizant of putting those in too, backing in. Uh, but again, I think the basic understanding of what does the enterprise generate in terms of cash? How, you know, how strongly do you believe there's visibility on that? And then to the extent that they can reinvest it. So return on equity is a big component that we follow. Uh, American Express, for instance, one of our favorite companies, 30% ROEs. So there's a company that generates capital. It's pretty significantly very high margins as well. Uh, and plenty of investment opportunities. So I, I wouldn't say that we do anything different than what we all learned in business school. Um, so it's it's looking at the cash generating abilities, looking some of the dynamics around the competitive uh, aspects. So you know it, within the industry, does it have higher margins than others? Um, does it have lower uh, funding costs, uh, et cetera? You know, so that that all goes to competitive positioning, and then you know. Uh, through private market value with a catalyst, we look at relative multiples, uh, we look at present transactions, uh, and that's how we kind of come to a mosaic and, and build our intrinsic value. Great. No, I, I think that's a helpful explanation. Hopefully that answers uh, our, the question. Um, do you expect Berkshire, Berkshire to make any large acquisitions? Wow. Uh, I would I would hope so. Uh, but I, I think as history, recent history has seen, has shown, it's been a challenge. And I think they've articulated that. I mean, they certainly have a lot of cash uh, at 100 and almost 70 billion. And I think we've talked about they're generating operating earnings of close to 800 million per week that they have to allocate. Uh, so, you know, a great position to be in. I think the firm has been a little frustrated that they haven't been able to employ more capital in, in a bigger way. Uh, they've talked about competition from private equity, uh, higher valuations. So typically it's been, you know, um, more difficult. And then just the, the universe that they can detail too is, I mean, you know, if you're talking about 50 billion being put to work, that's not relevant to, to so many companies. Uh, we have seen them deploy capital in Japan. So pretty significant, and that's done pretty well. They're issuing some more debt over there. So I imagine you'll start to see uh, more allocation of capital there. Uh, but as Jamie Dimon said on his call, retained earnings. So the cash that they have is not necessarily just wasted capital. It's actually stored earnings. So to the extent that they could do a $50 billion acquisition, uh, that would be a creative certainly to their operating earnings uh, and would be helpful to their multiple and, and franchise value. So uh, and we know they have a great history of doing acquisitions appropriately. So we'll just have to wait and see. But Again, I think the outlook in the interim is is not that strong um, to the extent that we did get more of a disturbance in the market. Uh, maybe it presents more of an opportunity. Yeah, no, that it'll be that'll be interesting to follow. Um, this is a fantastic question. What makes the Gabelli ETFs better than others? Well, we're just as competitive as anybody out there, so. Uh, We've been around for a long time, so we've employed, uh, you know, and been using a research methodology coined by our founder, uh, and we believe that it's been working very well. It's a value approach, and as I explained, the way we set up um, the GABF, you know, when we put it all together, at the end of the day, we feel good that we've built a relatively valuable portfolio with better business fundamentals around it, uh, and we have a great team of uh, investors here. So we have research analysts, a team of investor portfolio managers, 40. We have offices around the world. Um, and we have the intensity that that Mario brings to the table. And if anybody sees him and he's on TV all the time, that's the intensity he brings into the research. That's the intensity, the demands of analysts. And that's how we focus our day and, and interact with management. And I think that's, a you know, in addition to 
you know, having a, a, a methodology has been around for a long time that we've followed and um, just the understanding that we have this kind of entrepreneurial focus and intensity and, and discipline to our research process. So I'm as competitive as anybody. So are my teammates. Uh, we think we put together some pretty great value propositions for investors in terms of these ETFs, Tony Bancroft's as well, GCAD, uh, the growth fund, um, and then we, the automation portfolio um, and also our, our green portfolio. So there's a lot of great stuff there and we want to be the best and, and execute well for investors. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would I would definitely echo the the expertise of our portfolio managers and analysts and also the you know interesting thematic approaches that we're taking to the ETFs really uh, make us stand out in the market. Um, okay, we have an uh, an audience attendee who has owned your fund since the beginning. Thank you. Great performance. Uh, how do you think your fund is positioned for the long term outperformance versus the bench? Thoughts on your basket of stocks versus the magnificent versus the magnificent seven dominated S and P five hundred. So it's a great question. I, I would just address it in two ways. First, uh, I think if you you know we've performed. Uh, since inception, we've outperformed the S&P 500. So we feel pretty good that um, the companies that we've owned, um, you know, have done relatively well against the mag seven, five for whatever it is these days. Um, so that that's great. I would, I would note also that a company that we own, Apollo Global Investment, if you go look at their uh, assets under management uh, over a decade, uh, it's risen to, you know, over 600 billion today. And they highlight on their call that that revenue and that asset growth is actually faster than uh, some of those hyperscalers, those big growth tech businesses. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on, um, you know, especially in alternatives uh, with in tremendous opportunity uh, and, and, you know, in multiples that are more compelling. And then the last thing I would say on a fundamental basis, and I think this is recognized by the industry, uh, if you think about our, our economy in the United States growing at, you know, debatable two to three percent. Uh, real. Uh, but the payments industry, uh, so you think of MasterCard and American Express, is growing at 8%. And there are a number of reasons that it is. Uh, there's international exposures, there's adoption to uh, uh, credit versus uh, checks and stuff, digital finance. There's a host of reasons that are consolidating, but the growth rates are pretty steady. And we've seen that over time. And to the extent you own a business like American Express, which has top line visibility, uh, outlook, uh, you know, over 10% because they're in some of the best of breed uh, payments businesses. You know, that's a pretty compelling way to start versus just owning the S&P, which, you know, you would expect to grow a little bit more than perhaps GDP. Uh, and so I, I think when you just look at that step back, obviously it's important in terms of the price you pay for these securities, it's your ultimate return. Uh, but fundamentally, you feel pretty good that, you know, so the collection of these uh, individual stocks uh, will will outperform over time. And in, you know, as we know, in interim periods, some will underperform. Uh, and you know, part of that's just the emotional, the short-termism of perception around the stocks. But fundamentally, we, we feel really good about the stocks. Okay. Well, well, there you have it. Um, how do you believe that banks are going to increase revenues as bond yields are attracting more investors, as seen by revenue decreases for Bank of America and Citigroup, et cetera? Right. So two things, uh, I think the NIM inflection uh, this year, so that pricing the yield, uh, and we, you know, we got some further clarity on the calls last week. Uh, you know, that goes to kind of the bottoming out, and then to the extent that balance sheets start to grow from here, you'll have kind of a compounded effect, uh, and we, you'll see this um, in twenty five. So we're still in this, you know, the plane that's sort of trying to bottom out here. Uh, on the NIM side, so so that's one aspect. But if you think about banks in general, higher rates are good for them, uh, and a steeper yield curve is even better for them, right? And what's happened over the last two years is just we've had this incredible um, uh, Fed cycle, very high costs uh, or a very rapid rise in deposit costs, and and the banks have not been able to react accordingly. So you know, as you reprice thirty year loans and turnover, et cetera. Um, you know, those will give you some spread, but it just reacts differently in terms of rearranging uh, the book there. And, and so that'll eventually catch up. But to the extent that we've now had a more permanent shift in rates, uh, that's very desirable for banks over the time. And it'll it'll take a couple of years. And as we said this year, um, we'll see that inflection. Uh, but, you know, going forward and then to the extent that we do get a little higher, longer end 
and the Fed gives us some relief, you know, we'll be back to kind of some normalized curve as opposed to the inverted one, which, as we know, is is sometimes pertained to recessions, but also created this imbalance about how uh, the banks finance themselves versus uh, longer dated. Okay, great. Um, someone wants to know if you have a framework on how large or small a position can be in your ETF family of funds. So that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of components to that. First, uh, our benchmark is the S&P financials. Uh, and so there's a very large weighting of Berkshire Hathaway in that. And so uh, we're comfortable holding a, a fairly large weighting uh, of Berkshire Hathaway. And when you think about breaking up that company, you know, you could make it into five different S&P 500 companies. So very good diversification within that individual security, even though it is, is a kind of large weighting. And then we see lots of value there in terms of their capital allocation. We are constrained within the ETF on financial services institutions, 5% uh, weighting. So we could theoretically float above that uh, if if we uh, if there's price appreciation, but we cannot accumulate shares um, above a 5% weighting uh, in the banks, some asset managers, et cetera. Um, and so those have to remain under 5%, uh, just given the, the regulatory rules. Um, we've had some securities appreciate uh, pretty measurably uh, in the in the portfolio, so First Citizens last year, uh, they did a deal where they acquired Silicon Valley Bank. They <laughs> created ten billion of value. Stock was up one hundred percent, and so that jumped quite a bit in the portfolio. And as we accumulate more assets, you'll see that trend down in terms of the overall participation. But again, we it, it will move around, uh, but we do have some constraints and some risk metrics in terms of how we manage the portfolio. Okay, great. Yeah, no, we're getting some getting some great questions here from the audience. So please, please keep them coming. Um, okay, can you please provide a percentage of sector breakdowns of the fund, which I think you just touched on? Ah, uh, um, good question. Uh, so at this point, um, it's it's uh, it's fairly evenly balanced. Uh, I would say. Uh, in terms of across the, the subsector. So when we talk about that, my insurance, uh, banks, asset and wealth, uh, and and sort of the major bank and the brokerage firms as well. And then we have a specialty component. So we own S&P 500, we own Moody's, uh, and we own Faxet too as well. So kind of the, they service those industries. So I, I would say nothing materially to call out in terms of overweighting within the subsectors. Uh, if you look, we're more weighted, I think, are, are kind of our major holdings within the top 10 to the, to the leading institutions uh, on the money center banks and also alternatives. So that's a little more concentration there, but fairly diverse in terms of kind of those subsector uh, bets as well. Great. And uh, for our audience, we uh, will we'll follow up with um, specific information about the fund so you can uh, look into the specific details. Um. Okay, another great question. Uh, I'm a long-term investor. I love the compound interest power and the American capital system tailwind. On the topic of passive versus active investing, do you expect your fund to outperform the S&P over the next 10 years, over the next 30 years? So I would certainly hope so. That is that is why we come to work every day. Uh, no, I, there will be periods where uh, the fund doesn't. It's just the nature of the marketplace and uh, to some extent, we we had a very strong fourth quarter coming in the year, and there was a lot of there was a couple of firms that I would say got to fairly valued for us. Um, so we were not accumulating them in the portfolio. Uh, so they got a little ahead of where their fundamental progress had been at that point, and so that, that's kind of what we've backed off on. Um, and but I I do feel confident as as I mentioned in terms of adding up some of these internal metrics overall for the portfolio. That fundamentally, it's it's in a good place um, relative in terms of value, in terms of outlook for growth, visibility, and durability too. I think it's very important to understand. You know, when we had a, a banking crisis like we did a year ago with some major blowups, uh, the credit aspect of understanding which banks to own, and to the extent that you're in a passive vehicle uh, that mimics the S and P 500, you know, it it took losses from those failures. Um, and we were able to actually be better positioned because of First Citizens as an acquirer. Um, and so that's one advantage uh, in our space in terms of active, it, there's an element of credit involved. So we were able to uh, parse out companies that we think could be 
potentially more uh, disrupted than we saw that with Silicon Valley, Signature, et cetera. Uh, and obviously, we've seen some recent issues with New York Community Bank, and that highlights some of the potential issues with CRE. So I, I think that's a great component of active. The market's very fluid, very dynamic. There's going to a lot going to change in 30 years, but we feel good about a company like American Express uh, that, you know, it's just shown over time, great client engagement, uh, the ability to generate capital uh, and a long-term track record. Uh, you know, I would highlight another company, WR Berkeley is one of our favorites. Uh, they're an insurance company, specialty insurance. And if you think about that, that's a very simple business to understand. They insure different things, uh, but very difficult to execute on. Right. And uh, it's a terrific uh, management team, very entrepreneurial approach. They've done a wonderful job. And if you think about the insurance business, there's a lot of cyclicality that goes in over time. So we're in a hard market where premium uh, is desirable and they want to underwrite policy. And that's because there's less competition for capital, very high returns, but that will fluctuate. And there are some times when you have to pull back from capital. And if you look at WR, Bar WR Berkeley's history, uh, it's an extraordinary ability to deploy capital, pull it back, uh, reinvest in their own company, et cetera. And if you look at their, you know, these are the facts. Um, so from 1974 to 2022, they generated a 24% annualized CAGR for investors, 12% versus the S&P 500. Uh, and again, it's just a plain old insurance company. Uh, but, you know, you could have jumped in any uh, where along the way and would have generated pretty significant returns. And do I think history with them will change? Um, it'll be different, uh, but I think the outlook for their ability to do what they do will continue to be very strong. Yeah, I, I think these uh, company examples really, really highlight uh, some of the merits of, of an active investing approach, uh, which is what our next question is about. So to what extent do you see passive investing as a whole as a challenge or risk for active investing as the passive volume is getting so high? Passive funds like Vanguard, BlackRock, et cetera, having large stakes in all kinds of companies, therefore less float for active investing. Right. And I think that's a, a great point. And, you know, to be seen as to what overall this eventually gets us in terms of liquidity, dynamics. But I think as Warren Buffett pointed out, and we did put this in our commentary recently, you know, this, this casino-esque uh, type of activity that we see in the marketplace today, there's computer-driven strategies, momentum, uh, ETF rebalancings, and, and you get, you know, fairly significant anomalies in the short term that, you know, you're kind of scratching your head. Uh, so on the one part, it's, it's a little... Uh, distracting in terms of confidence in capital markets because you know you want the uh, overall fundamentals to be reflected appropriately, uh, but you do get these dynamic dislocations, and so we think it's an opportunity to stick with our discipline um, and and grab those opportunities. And you know you just look at um, history, and we, we've written this up in a couple of things that. Um, if you look at kind of this American tailwind of prosperity, this slow growth up to the right, um, and, and uh, we've had recessions and pandemics and wars, et cetera, but the volatility of our economic engine has been fairly consistent, but the marketplace, S&P 500, has been much more volatile. Um, and so we think Mr. Market's alive and well. We think that uh, the dynamics with ETFs present other opportunities there too as well. And uh, to the extent that you stay focused on the understanding of owning partial businesses uh, and, or uh, stakes in, in businesses, long-term approach, low turnover, and, and faith in the American corporate system, we think you'll do very well and, and have lots of opportunity going forward to, to do that. Great. No, no, I like that, uh, that optimistic tone. Uh, okay. You've had some great answers for all of our uh, audience questions that we might, we might be able to throw you with this one. Um, any color on Tesla electrification of the fleet and overall competitive direction of automotive as we move toward electrification, Mario being an expert, auto expert, I know you don't cover the auto space. So, uh, we can certainly talk to Brian Sponheimer, our colleague who does follow that space, but any thoughts on the auto sector? So I, I um, I'll, I'll look my colleagues. I mean, they follow Tesla more closely. Um, I will say Tesla, you know, to some extent is a barometer for the understanding about AI investing. And, you know, we haven't talked about it here today, but if you think about investors being preoccupied, how am I going to position my portfolio? And the obvious answer is the Googles, the Apples, et cetera, uh, Tesla to some extent, right, uh, outside their autos. Uh, and so from my perspective, I do believe that we will be in this incredible productivity uplift. 
Um, and that's through compute, that's through optimization, uh, automation, et cetera. Um, there's a number of terms you can use. And if you think about the investing landscape, who is best positioned uh, for some of these dynamics? And just the big ones would be large data sets, big customer engagement, and risk management, right? And so you think about financial services, wow, uh, a firm like JP Morgan, you know, the, the incredible digital platform, incredible risk management, uh, incredible uh, ability to provide offerings to their clients, uh, and, and and obviously huge users of compute. And so there's an opportunity uh, to enhance their productivity. Um, so we see an incredible opportunity for financial services on the obvious level, uh, but also on the unobvious level. So risk management, et cetera, um, automation, the cost of programming coming down, and also the efficiency with running data centers, as we know. Uh, so uh, if you're looking for an AI derivative to the mainstream kind of headlines, I think financial services are a wonderful place to look at opportunities, and you get pretty fair multiples as well. Uh, so I think that's going to be uh, an opportunity. And also fundamentally for me, you know, the ROEs have the potential to, to increase. And I think that's a, a fascinating fundamental component too as well. Uh, and, and then lastly, I would just say that one gating factor uh, for uh, AI, though, in financial services is the advancement of regulations and the regulatory authorities. So to the extent that, you know, you can automate certain risk controls, yes, that's wonderful and maybe uh, better for the company, uh, but the, you, you obviously can't go faster than what the regulatory authorities would deem uh, sensible, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, again... You know, these companies will be able to benefit, but there will be some gating from kind of the progress and alignment with the regulations. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's really, really interesting to hear your thoughts on that. I think, you know, every, everyone's uh, interested in understanding how AI will uh, impact the various industries. So really helpful to hear. Um, so can you talk about the uh, aging of the population and what that means for the future wealth transfer to younger generations? Right. So one of our uh, more macro themes, too, embodying um, some of the firms that we own, so we own uh, Morgan Stanley, for instance, is a you know huge wealth management business uh, and Charles Schwab um, and some other names as well. And there's this, as we know, there's changing demographics in the country. We have the aging baby boomers, which were a huge source of retirement savings. Um, and as um, that gets older in generation, there'll be the tremendous transfer of wealth to younger generations. And there was a Fed report that talked about this being, you know, over 20 trillion over time with that generation. Uh, in the next decade, they believe uh, it's going to be 16 trillion. So if we average that, that's 1.6 trillion per year, just simple numbers. But that compared to the stimulus package or some of these other components that we see on the fiscal side, or just relative to uh, the overall GDP at over 20 trillion, you know, it's pretty significant numbers. And, and what it will mean is, you know, kind of the trust that will include home ownership, that will include uh, retirement savings, et cetera. So that will um, come down to different generations. It'll be more demand for asset and wealth products, advice, et cetera. Um, and, and good flows in terms of redeployment of those asset allocations. And we think these companies like Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley are, are really well positioned to capitalize on that. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for answering all of our audience questions. Uh, I guess to, to wrap us up here, uh, my final question is uh, you earlier mentioned uh, entrepreneurial mindsets in your uh, when when thinking about companies. Um, so what is that entrepreneurial mindset and why do you look for that characteristic in management teams and companies? This is one of my favorite topics and I often repeat myself with this word. I think I drive my family crazy with, uh, with this term as well. Uh, but I really believe in it and it was something that was embodied in me at, at Columbia and my professor there. Um, I'm very uh, uh, close to in terms of his mantra. And, and it's the idea of this, this, you know, entrepreneurial mindset is just very simple. Um, you, know, you can look up entrepreneur. It's just the, the efficient use of capital, the complete mindfulness in terms of wastefulness within a company, the driven culture, the competitive components to it. Uh, you know, I think my favorite analogy would be like looking at Tom Brady. Um, in terms of his resource management and staying with it, you know, when he was at Michigan and keeping going and he turned out to be one of the most incredible athletes there was. And if you if you look at his uh, consistency and his approach, 
um, that just, and his leadership, um, it's just, it's an incredible thing. And um, I don't think that is a common characteristic among corporates, among people. There's just a unique set of people and, and, and cultures that have that. And it's, once you hook into that, you see the opportunity uh, of those management teams to bring together, to power those cultures. And it's great to have good management teams, but entrepreneurial management teams just seem to be able to uh, compete better, generate better returns, and ultimately reward shareholders. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, it, it, it can be small firms. It, it can, it's not necessarily tech firms. I think of, uh, for instance, American Express is a great example, uh, listening to Steve Squarey. I mean, uh, he just, you know, they pivoted their capital allocation during the pandemic. They were investing uh, when everybody was pulling back. And it in, because of that, a capital allocation allowed them to accelerate their earnings growth. It allowed them to take share and allowed them to engage with their customers even more coming out of the pandemic. So there was a big company, very focused, uh, tops down in terms of the message and mission for the company. And there you got the intangible in terms of the future returns um, from that capital allocation. So I don't think that there are the companies are uniform in this approach. So I look for that entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, we've seen it historically, Berkshire Hathaway, for instance, and in how he wants to acquire companies, owner operators, degree of ownership. There's lots of things to discuss on this, but you just know when you hook into one of these companies that these people are driven, they understand what their mission is, uh, and they have a history too of executing on that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, uh, you know, Mario being an entrepreneur himself, that entrepreneurial culture is is very evident here at our firm. And so that's great to hear that that's a you know important criteria that you look at when making investment decisions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Mac, for your thoughtful responses to mine and our audience's questions. It was great having you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. You should consider the ETF's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before you invest. The ETF's prospectus is available from G. Distributors LLC, a registered broker dealer and FINRA member, and contains this and other information about the ETFs and should be read carefully before investing. To obtain a prospectus, please call 888-GABELLI or visit www.gabelli.com slash funds slash ETFs slash intro.